No, I'm just kidding. But I hope you've had a great week. Uh, I've really enjoyed spring break. My wife, Marianne, is a school teacher. And so she's had all week off. And her family uh, has been able to come up and visit us from Roswell, New Mexico. So it's been fun having them join us this week as we try to pack in as much activity as we can do as possible into the short amount of time. But we have a lot to cover today. Uh, we're going through John chapter 9. We're going to do the whole chapter. So we're going to do 41 verses. Actually, we're not going to do that. That'd be way too much, right? But go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 9. So we're going to go and turn to John chapter 9. We're going to be looking at this passage that most people, I think, most of us have kind of seen as, you know, Jesus healing the blind man. And it's, it'd be really easy to look at this chapter and think that this whole thing is just about, you know, this blind man who was born blind but now receives sight. But see, to look at it with only that much depth is really just scratching the surface of something that is even like a much bigger deal, something even more miraculous that's happening. So if you're here this morning and, and maybe you're a little skeptical or you still have some, some questions, John has a message for you. If you're, a, if you're a new Christian, maybe you've just become a follower of Christ or something like that, and you're still kind of working through things, you're brand new into this, John has a message for you. Or maybe you've, you're a seasoned veteran, you've, you've walked with Jesus for most of your life, you grew up in the church as a kid. John has a message for you. You see, this message that we're going to go through today, this, this chapter 9 here, and these short 41 verses, we're going to see something that is so relevant to every single one of us. And it's incredibly powerful. It's incredibly important. And it kind of all centers around this question Jesus asks in verse 35. It says, do you believe? So before we get into all that, I want to give you a quick synopsis, an overview of all 41 verses. Because we don't have time to read them all. Uh, we'd be here for very, we'd probably be here until next week. So the very beginning, Jesus is kind of hanging out. He's in, he's in Jerusalem. He's near the temple. His disciples come up to him. They see this guy and they say, Rabbi, this man born blind, is it his own sin or the sin of his parents that he was born blind? And so this begins a dialogue with Jesus and, and Jesus ultimately uh, talks to them and, and then begins the process of healing this blind man, which some of us may be familiar with the story. If you haven't, here's how it goes. Jesus gets like some dirt and he starts spitting into it, mixes it up, makes like a mud paste and covers the guy's eyes. It's crazy. And he gets healed. From there, uh, the scripture only calls these people neighbors. These are people who just were really familiar with this, this, this blind man. They would have seen him begging at the temple for most of his life. And it says the neighbors saw him and were just completely shocked that he had been healed. Like how, how could this man who was born blind now see? They were so in utter disbelief that they thought there's no way this is the same guy. He actually has to say, no, I'm the same man. They thought it was a case of mistaken identity. And so he says, I'm the guy. And they're like, well, how did this happen? And so in their confusion, they decide, well, we should probably go talk to the Pharisees, these religious leaders. Perhaps they can help explain what appears to be an, a, an act of God of some sort. So they go to the Pharisees and these guys are just really stubborn and they don't want to believe that God did this. They don't want to think, they don't want anyone thinking that Jesus might actually be the guy he says he is, the son of God. And from that, what would ensue there is, is pretty much the rest of the chapters. This, this kind of back and forth between the Pharisees and this blind man about what happened and how things went down and what, and what it really all means. And so that's kind of where we pick up in the story is in the very beginning, we're going to see with our first point is that, and you'll see this on your bulletin, belief begins the process of understanding. Now, I think this, this chapter has one of the best examples, maybe one of the best, in all of scripture of the story of a believer from beginning to end. The life of a believer from the, from the very beginning to the very end, when we kind of get all, all the way through all that. It just does such a great job of communicating that. But before I go into our verses, there's one thing that we need to clear up. I think it's a major misunderstanding, and it's something that I have seen in myself that I know I've been guilty of. Maybe some of you have kind of had this, this um, misconception or you've known someone who has. And it goes like this. Belief is not the beginning. Or it's not the finish line, but rather it's the beginning. 
believing in Jesus is not the, the, the finish line. It's not the end of everything. It's the very beginning of all things. It's not like, I mean, of course, it's great to see someone come up and, you know, become a follower of Jesus or they, they bring come before the church and they get baptized. But, but those acts are not the end of the process for the Christian. They're not the finale or the, the big climactic moment. It's just the very beginning. It's a starting line, not a finish line. Belief is a starting line. And so with that understood, I want us to look at verses 6 and 7. We're going to see this, uh, the actions of this man born blind help to demonstrate that. In verse 6, having said these things, this is Jesus, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. He went and washed and came back seeing. So this is a, a huge point right here. This man is blind. He, he can probably hear that it's Jesus and they're saying, oh, Jesus, Rabbi. They can probably understand who is kind of in front of him. There's a guy in front of him, but he can't see him. He doesn't know much more than that. He doesn't have, he's blind. I think this is the epicenter or the crossroads for this guy where he can choose to believe. He can, I mean, he has this mud made of this guy's spit all on his face, right? He could make the decision, just wipe it off in disgust. Or he could go to the pool of Siloam, which means sent, wash it all off, and follow Jesus' instructions exactly. And he does the latter, and he's healed. And so we begin to see, here's the beginning, where he was like, you know what, maybe this is kind of a new thing. No one's, no one's done this to me before. Maybe there is something to this guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to trust him. And see, that's, that's what's so key about this is his response. Scripture doesn't quite communicate, doesn't make it very clear about why Jesus uses this dirt and his own saliva. There's, there's lots of different thoughts on it, but I think the more important part is his response. The fact that he chose to do exactly as Jesus had said, not even knowing who the guy was in front of him. And now this next part I want us to see, if you have a, like a pen or a highlighter and you, or you like to write in your Bible, this is a really important thing to catch. We're going to go through a series of verses, and what I want you to do is I want you to notice some certain words, and I'll point them out to you. They're specific because what we're going to see is this process. We're going to see a progression, because earlier I said belief is the, the starting line, right? Belief begins the process of understanding. So we're going to see the blind man move through this process of understanding who Jesus is. So in verse 10, we're going to go through 10 through 12. So they said to him, these are the neighbors, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. So did y'all catch it? He said, the man called Jesus. Man. All right, that's pretty basic, right? That's pretty, all right, there's a, doesn't sound like a girl. It must be a man. That's pretty simple. No surprise there. Let's move ahead. Verses 15 and 17. So the Pharisees, so now he's having this discussion with the Pharisees, again asked him, how had he received his sight? And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. And so they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. So he's moved from man to prophet. We're kind of seeing that progression, right? You don't have to turn here, but we're going to get there in a second. Verse 38, and it'll show up behind me. Where he, uh, the blind man actually has a discussion with Jesus where he actually says, you are Lord. So that's this process, right? He started with the man called Jesus, went from man to he's a prophet, so he's Lord. He's starting, to, he's starting to understand it, right? He's starting to go through this process, this progression of sorts. Every person that comes to a saving faith in Jesus Christ has walked this path. We've all gone from some first said, Jesus is a man to agree that he existed. He was a real guy. All right. Then to a prophet, you start saying things to yourself like, man, I kind of like 
This sounds good. I like the things he's teaching. This kind of makes sense to me as someone who's speaking for God. And lastly, he's Lord. At that point, that's, that's the moment, y'all. That's the moment when we surrender our lives to God and we recognize that we are in need of a Savior and it's only Jesus who can save. And that's the progression we're making. It's the same progression this blind man is making. And it started with just the tiniest of belief. You see, it's that belief that starts so small that initiates us into a process, a lifelong process of understanding God. Do you know what three words, what three words nearly every Christian is afraid to say? It's these three words that I've heard so many times, even myself, I've, I've been afraid to say these things. I don't know. I don't know. It's such a, I mean, I, I hear it from so many people. One of the reasons we're so afraid to share our faith or talk about Jesus is because what if someone asks me a question and I have to say, I don't know. It's like this, this thing, church, we, we've got to understand. It's okay to not know. It's okay to not have all the answers. In fact, I hope that in your relationship with Christ, that it's, it has grown to be so wide and so deep that there are seeing things you still don't fully understand. The reality is, if you think somehow, with your brief time here on earth, you've, you've managed to become capable of understanding the enormity of God, the majesty and the magnitude and the greatness of our Lord and the mystery of the universe, that you've been able to somehow do that, there might be something wrong. I've known my wife, Marianne, for seven years and there's still things I'm learning about her. Like, I don't quite have it all figured out yet. And I'm sure many husbands could probably say the same things about their wives. We're still learning. It's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. It's okay to ask questions, not to have the answer all the time. Because like that blind man, belief begins the process of understanding. If you're here this morning and, and you're saying, well, you know, I, I'm not quite sure I believe, Scott. There's still a few things. I have a few unanswered questions in my head. And if I could just get some of these answers, I think I, think I get it figured out. See, here's... Here's the issue is that unbelief almost never just drifts toward belief. In fact, unbelief usually drifts away from belief. It drifts into more and more unbelief. But belief, y'all, when you believe, it can grow. Because belief begins the process of understanding. It is indeed a process. I remember... I was 18 years old. It was two days before my birthday. I was going to be 19. And I was alone in my room. I live in the living room of my house. There's no one else there. And uh, I got down on the ground and I prayed, God, save me. Help me. And this is, a, this is such a monumental time in my life. I look back on it with just so much gratitude for God working in my life in that moment. What I didn't understand at that time, I didn't know anything about the, the controversy over imputed righteousness versus the infused righteousness of Christ or the propitiation of Jesus Christ on the cross or the justifying act of his atonement. None of that made any sense to me. I didn't even know it existed. And I'm not saying that we don't need or we ought not pursue the deep theological understanding of God. What I am saying is that you do not need a seminary degree to be a follower of Jesus. Belief begins the process of understanding. It can start so small. And the thing I love about this, this guy, this, this, this man who was born blind, is we see in his belief, the smallest belief, the, the man called Jesus. Because that was what happened in verse 6 and 7. Jesus told him what to do. And as far as we know, all he knew about Jesus was, this is a man telling me to do something. In his willingness to believe, he obeyed. His belief led to his obedience. And this is what's going to take us into our next point. Is that belief invites the believer to experience God. 
So verses 24 and 25, we're going to look at this now. So now we're, we've kind of moved more in the story. The blind man is now having a lot more dialogue, almost kind of like a court proceeding, almost like a court case with these Pharisees. And here's how it reads. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. I like this a lot. This is the second time he's being questioned and he, he has this, this amazing answer. These guys, it's funny, the Pharisees can't even bring themselves to say the name Jesus. They say, we know that man is a sinner. And the response of this blind man, or once now healed blind man, is, is incredible. He says, whether the man is a sinner, I do not know. But I do know that I was blind and now I see. It's almost like his experience is helping his belief. His experience with God is almost informing his belief. And here's, here's a really cool thing, y'all. I'm going to say this in a second, and I'm going to put it up on the screen, but not quite yet. Um, when we believe God, it helps us to trust God. And when we trust God, it helps us to obey God. And when we obey God, we get to experience God. So go ahead and put that graphic up here for me, Joseph. So um, my wife's a teacher, a really good one, and she came up with this cool cycle thing for me. Um, it's really fun because you see how belief goes to trust. Trust goes into obey or obedience, obedience into experience, and it kind of continues it. Now the reality is some of us in our, in our walk with Christ may spend a little more time in certain areas than others. I think the, uh, the trust area may be one where we're spending a lot of time. We're just kind of walking by faith. We can't really see it. We're just trusting that God's in it. Or the obedience part where we're like, God, I've been doing the thing you told me to do for the past five years. And, and it kind of goes back to the trust part, right? But the more you find yourself in this, the more you get to experience God, which continues to empower your belief, which makes the whole thing function even better. When we believe God, we trust God. When we trust God, we obey. And when we obey, we get to experience. This man born blind had the opportunity to obey Jesus or to disobey. One of those choices led to him experiencing an incredible miracle. I mean, scientifically, his eyes weren't just opened. They had to be neural connections in his brain that had to change. Nerve, uh, nerve cells had to be developed so they could process the colors and the images coming in. Um, if you know anything about babies, they, like, I think they see like in black and white for a while and then their depth isn't even much further than a few inches or a few feet until they get older and older and older. I think it's not until they're two years old can a baby fully see, but this man did it in an instant. He got to experience God. Don't you want to experience God? The, the greatest thing is that when we follow this, we invite God to lead us in our marriages. We invite God to lead us in our finance. We invite God to lead us in our relationships, our job, our mortgages, our fears. God begins to have control and sovereignty over it all. We look to him to say, Lord, I'm trusting you. Where do you want me to walk? I want to be obedient so I can experience you. Consider the opposite. In verse 28, we're going to skip, we're going to skip down there really quick. We see this response after the blind man's been talking. And the Pharisees say, or it's described, and they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Now, if, if you saw it previously in, the, in verse 24, they also use the word know. We know this man is a sinner. And now two more times, we know, we know. There's so much of this, this idea of like, we know this and we don't know this. What they're really saying is that they, they trust something they're familiar with. This idea of, saying God has done this in the past and so we, we, we trust that thing. It's this idea of holding God hostage 
in the future thinking he's only capable of doing whatever you think he did in the past. Saying God is in his infinite power these guys have, have narrowed God and put him inside this box saying, well, God did this way back when. We know about Moses and all these things. And, and so God has to be like that. This man, Jesus, this is something new. It's almost as though God is somehow not allowed to do some, to work in some new or, or unique or different way. Which is kind of crazy considering we have a God who has literally said, behold, I am making all things new. We, we must not, I'll say this, we must not make the mistake of allowing ourselves to, to put knowledge or, or experiential awareness in the position that only faith belongs. If we put anything in the place where faith alone is supposed to be functioning, we find ourselves in a lot of trouble. I think it's, it can be so easy for us to, to kind of shake our fingers at these guys and say, well, they're, these religious leaders, they didn't know what they were doing. You know, those, they're, they're, they're making a mistake. This is Jesus, right? But I think there's a real concern that we might be making the same mistake here in the church in America in today's time. Right now, there are churches all across this country shutting their doors forever. Most of them saying things like, well, we've always done it this way. This is the good old way to do it. A few months ago, I was able to have, I had the opportunity to get to preach about worship and, and we talked about songs and stuff. And it's so easy to see us make this mistake with songs sometimes. And we say, well, no, I mean, God only works in this type of song and not this kind. We cannot think that God is somehow only going to stay in one stagnant place. And he's not a dynamic God constantly making things new and bringing transformation. Absolutely, there needs to be respect for tradition. I believe that. But if we're investing our time and our energy and our money into something just because it, it used to be good or, or that's like the good old day, like that's the way it's supposed to be, like that's what we've seen God do in the past. He's gonna, he's gonna keep doing that thing. I think we just need to be careful. Always ask ourselves, are we making the mistake of putting our experience in the position where faith belongs? If you've been walking with God for any period of time, you know sometimes faith doesn't make any sense. When, when you base things on experience, you're like, this is a bad idea, but all right, God. Well, yeah, it's crazy, you know? Like, things sometimes just kind of work out. And I don't want to say kind of. We're kind of simplifying the majesty and the providence of God. But even this church, this ministry sometimes, I'm so glad we're a people of faith. Because there are so many things that we do that don't really make much sense. If we based our things on past experience, we might not take that step when faith is demanding it. Belief invites the believer to experience God. When we have our minds, our heart, our our submission lined up with the truth of Scripture and we understand what God is asking of us. Guys, we, we will get to have the opportunity, the privilege to, to bear each other's burdens, to, to get to fight and sacrifice for the cause of Christ. We will get to love one another. We will get to do and be present like Moses. We will get to be witness to the wonders of God. And this is taking us to our, our last and, and final point. Belief is the miracle. The belief is the miracle. It's belief in Jesus alone that leads to worship. In verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. So just a recap on that. The Pharisees got so upset with the, the blind man who kept saying all these things about Jesus they cast him out of the synagogue. He was completely kicked out. You cannot come back. 
You're not allowed. When Jesus heard, they cast him out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. He's now professed Jesus as Lord and the first thing he does is choose to worship God, to worship Jesus. And, and why wouldn't he? I mean, when we fully recognize that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords, that he took the punishment for our sin, took the penalty, died on a cross, three days later was resurrected, proving power over death and sin. How can we not have an encounter with that Lord and just fall on our face in complete uh, holy, uh, irreverence and just awe? Like, it's just, it's just incredible. When that really takes, takes hold of your heart, by you almost you almost want to step back like oh my gosh when you see how good Jesus is see belief is the miracle when we when we choose to worship Jesus we're not talking about a specific time or place, you know, it's that, like, like, it's like we were talking about, it's this, it's this lifestyle of worship, it's, it's everything that you do, it's this idea of bringing your body, and presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice before God, to be holy and used by him. I think the, I, I, I believe the prayer of, of every believer ought to sound something like Isaiah uh, in chapter 6, verse 8, where he says, here am I, Lord, send me. Because we have this incredible opportunity to go and share this belief in Jesus with the entire world. It's a, I mean, in Matthew 28, it's called the Great Commission. It's this mission that we have, that we've been sent out to share the gospel, the people in our families, the people in our communities, and in every single nation around the world. You can never be bored as a Christian. There's always stuff you got to do. Seven billion people, right? There's always someone who needs to hear it. And while I think there is definitely such a thing as this spiritual blindness where we don't fully recognize God, we don't fully see it, it's such a miracle that, that this guy could even come to an understanding of Jesus. See, belief is what changes everything. Belief is what compels us to lead these radically different lives that, that just uh, profess and testify to the presence and the work and love of Jesus Christ in our lives. I, uh, I entitled this the sermon for today, The Moon and the Sun. It's kind of tongue-in-cheek. It's, it's not a typo. See, the moon, if you check up in the sky, the moon has this responsibility, has this ability to, to reflect the light of the sun, Right? Like the moon, the believer has the responsibility to reflect the light of Jesus, the Son of God, the light of the world. We are to function like the moon, a reflection of Jesus Christ to the whole world, lighting up the darkness, breaking through even the darkest of night, sometimes showing up in the middle of the day too. That is our responsibility. You do not have to go save the world. You don't even have to save that one person sitting next to you. That's what Jesus is doing. We're just reflecting the light, saying, have you heard about Jesus? I'll believe in him, and he's incredible. If someone says, well, tell me why. I'm, well, he loves me. Well, why? Well, I don't know. That's all I got. That's okay. It's okay not to know, because that's enough. The Holy Spirit's going to do the rest of it. Sometimes you may be called to do a little bit more. Some of us will hopefully answer the call to, to take missions across the ocean. And there is a reality that it is dangerous. It is risky. And here in America, you know, oh, danger. <laughs> Get my extra seatbelt on. You know, like we're, 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 we don't want to be in danger. You just got to trust God. That's part of that whole wheel. And you'll get to experience God. And there's one more thing I want to put up here. It's a quote from Henry Blackaby. He's this author of this book called Experiencing God. 
Phenomenal book, great Bible study. If you ever get a chance, definitely spend some time with it, but it'll come up up here. It says, if Christians around the world were to suddenly renounce their personal agendas, their life goals, and their aspirations, and begin responding in radical obedience to everything God showed them, the world would be turned upside down. How do we know? Because that's what first century Christians did, and the world is still talking about it. It starts with belief. There's lots of things we don't know about God. I'm, I mean, was it? Um, eight years ago, nine years ago, I was in my living room. God, save me. I'm not doing stuff right. That's all I knew. And now, because I don't know, God's awesome or something, I'm up here messing up my mic and all that stuff. Like, it's incredible. Belief begins the process of understanding. And when we believe, you're invited to get to experience the wealth of God's presence. And guys, the miracle isn't him being able to see. It's him believing. I had one of my friends in college, his name is Kyle Steinle. Um, he once said the most terrifying, crazy thing to me ever. He's this incredible kid. He's like a genius, y'all. Um, he taught himself how to play piano by listening to like a video or something. Um, he's an incredible like bread chef. Like you can make bread. Um, he's really good at making bread. And he has like the best dog. Like he has this Labrador dog who's literally the coolest dog ever. I mean, it's so obedient. It's fun. He's awesome. Uh, but when he was a kid, something really tragic happened to him. And it's amazing that his mind is still as good as it is. I met him in college. I didn't know him as a kid. But his brother shot him in the back of the head. Accidentally. Um, he survived. Uh, I think it was like a 22. So maybe, just, and I don't know. I'm not going to go into details. Uh, he's blind. He's completely blind. I asked him, like, can you see anything? He's like, well, I see, like, everything's kind of black, but I see, like, color. Like these weird, you know, kind of like the like Microsoft weird spinny screens, everything. He's like, kind of like that. And I was like, even when you go to sleep, he's like, yeah, but you get used to it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. I mean, I remember one time I went to his apartment for breakfast, for lunch after church. And uh, it's funny, like, I don't like, I don't, I'm not being just, he's, he's awesome. So he opens the door and he, I, uh, I'm like, hey, how's it going? And I had to like, I bent down to grab some groceries and I guess he thought I walked in. So he closed the door on me and I was like, what? <laughs> And he's like, I was like, oh, he's like, did you come in? I'm like, no. Um, his apartment was always like, I'm like, why are the lights off? He's like, you look at me like, seriously, Scott? I'm like, my bad. I just, it, I don't know. It's my first time. I'm like, you know, and he was so much fun. He would always make bread for us. He was a super cool guy. And here's the thing he said, y'all, because he wasn't a Christian, like super, he's going to be some mathematical genius professor. That's what he's going to do. He said, God had to make me blind so I could see. Which was crazy because what happened was in his dependency on God from having his vision taken from him closer to a saving faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it's such a, a, a funny backwards sounding thing. And just to wrap up, uh, it blows my mind that the miracle isn't, isn't the seeing, but it's it's the believing, that that's the thing of eternal significance. And so earlier I said, if you're here this morning, you still have a few unanswered questions. You're just like, I'm, I'm just not sure. Or maybe you're here and, and you just feel like you're in this season of life where your doubts just seem to outweigh some of your faith. And it just feels like things aren't going to get better. I just want to remind you the purpose of John. He says, that he says these things in his gospel, these things have been written so that you may know Jesus and you may believe that he is the son, Jesus the Christ. And right here down on the, on the bottom, and you may have life in his name. Believing is the beginning. And you don't have to have all the answers. If you're sitting on the fence, that's okay. You can have your answers, they'll be answered. It takes time. So I want to leave us with this last question, this question that Jesus asked, do you believe? Let's pray.